Hello everyone, and welcome to today's installment in the CAF-C Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder webinar series. Today's installment is entitled, Screening with a Toolkit, an Introduction and Overview. For previous installments in this webinar series, everyone can go to the CAF-C Knowledge Exchange Network at www.can.cafc.org, and you, you, we will be posting all of the recordings of all of, our, all of the webinars that are part of this series. Uh, the first webinar, webinar that was done a few weeks ago by Dr. Sterling Claren and Dr. Christine Locke was uh, titled FASD 101. It was an intro introduction to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder to, to the disease. Today's episode is more focused on CAFC's FASD screening toolkit. We're going to be talking about the development of the toolkit, how we came to consensus on the tools that have been included, and, and some of the plans for moving forward, and a, and a little bit of a, a description on each of the tools. We have two great presenters today. Uh, our first presenter is, will be Ms. Elaine Orbein, uh, the President and CEO of the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centres. And our second presenter today will be Dr. Gideon Corrin, the Director of the Mother Risk Program from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, without further ado, I will be handing the presentation over to uh, Elaine Orbein. Thank you, Doug, and, and uh, my pleasure to welcome everyone as well. Um, this is a, a true honor for CAFC to be um, playing really a knowledge brokering role and to be sharing the work and at least the um, FASD screening toolkit as a work in progress and really to share our work to date, how we got to this point, and really to, to get your feedback on the opportunities we hope that we're making available to you um, as a multidisciplinary uh, group of professionals to actually use the tool to feel and touch it and really become part of our piloting of, of these tools uh, going forward. So I thought it would be helpful just to provide a very brief overview of what we are planning for you on, on, on this being our second webinar. And I would love to provide a little bit about CAF-C, our focus on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, the screening toolkit development process, our screening definition, the various criteria that we used in selecting the tools that are contained within the kit to date, the actual launch of our toolkit. Um, Dr. Corin will provide some very in-depth information and um, sort of research background on the tools themselves. We will close the formal part of the uh, webinar with uh, an overview of our current dissemination and education strategy, knowledge translation, and uh, next steps. And as Doug mentioned, we'll have several points throughout the presentation where we will stop and take a breath and uh, Giddy and I will be sort of passing the baton back and forth and also have an opportunity for uh, questions and answers. And we really look forward to your, um, your voices being a part of today's webinar. So just very briefly about CAFC for those who are not familiar with our organization. CAF was co-founded in 1968 by the leaders of the children's hospitals across Canada. Today, CAFC is proud to support, it's, we're actually approximately 50 organizations representing multidisciplinary health professionals that provide health service delivery to children, youth, and their families within acute care hospitals community health centers, rehabilitation centers, as well as home care provider agencies across our country. And really what I've just described is what CAFC refers to often as crossing the continuum of care. All of our children's hospitals in the country are members of CAFC, and that really does provide tremendous linkage to clinical care, education, and research. CAFC's mission statement um, is that CAFC supports its members and partner organizations through education, very much what we're doing today, research, quality improvement initiatives, all aimed at improving health service delivery for Canada's children and youth. How do we do this? And hopefully you'll be able to see our work in FASD in each one of these bullets 
by advocating for the unique character and importance of the health and health care for our children and youth, identifying and responding to emerging issues and trends that impact our communities. And I think FASD in relationship to this identifying and responding to emerging issues is something that probably every one of us on the webinar today share. Building a community of practice to share research, knowledge, and expertise. Building strategic partnerships and facilitating collaboration. And certainly in our development of this toolkit, those strategic partnerships and tremendous collaboration from really throughout North America has been a big part of, of helping us to get where we are today. Leveraging opportunities to advance health service delivery priorities, again, through education research and improved health care. And then finally, promoting best practices in quality improvement as well as patient safety. CAFC's five strategic priorities um, in, in, in order are establishing programs and activities that address current and emerging child and youth health care priorities, advocating for transforming health service delivery for our population, connecting service providers and key stakeholders to realize shared child and youth health care goals, and that in part is what we're doing today as well. Fostering research, brokering knowledge, facilitating educational opportunities, and enhancing information exchange with, within our healthcare community as well as with our external partners, and finally building capacity and enhancing the organization's health to ensure that we can in fact realize our objectives and meet the needs of our members and, uh, and partners. All of that information that I just shared with you around our strategic priorities and vision forward is described in, in, in a lot of detail, and this document uh, can be found on our, uh, on our website, and the URL, of course, was demonstrated in the previous slide. And just to remind everyone that all of the slides that Dr. Corrin and I will present this afternoon will be made available to all. Um, just a very quick snapshot of CAFC's um, website, and uh, this is just our, our home page and a little bit outdated, but this is what you will find. And in fact, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is listed as a program on our website, and a lot of the information that we will touch on today will be found in, in, in much more detail on the website, and I would certainly invite everybody to, um, to have a peek when, when you get a moment. Um, I also want to point out that one way to get to the Knowledge Exchange Network that Doug mentioned is a simple click on Ken from CAFC's uh, homepage. So our National Screening Toolkit bringing us right to the, the subject at hand for today's webinar and the work that has brought us to the uh, launch and publication of our National Screening Toolkit for Children and Youth Identified and Potentially Affected by Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. So a little bit of background that, that some of you are probably very familiar with, and that of course was a, a very important and key milestone, and that was on March 1st of 2005, the publication um, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal um, on the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Guidelines. This is, these are diagnostic guidelines. The development of the guidelines was facilitated by the Public Health Agency of Canada as well as Health Canada. And we all recognized, however, that when these guidelines were published, there were no valid and reliable screening toolkit, screening tools, I should say, for consistent screening of children for a possible FASD. So I'm going to begin, and you're going to hear um, me emphasize this, and I know that Dr. Corrin will emphasize it as well, is today we are focusing on screening and not diagnosis. And in fact, we really must understand the unique uh, and important differences in, in, that, uh, in that statement. Therefore, <clears throat> again, not having those consistent screening toolkits really limited the ability of healthcare, allied health professionals, and families working with children with behavioral and learning disabilities 
to consistently screen for FASD and, ref and, and refer for further assessment and diagnosis. Therefore, to address the need for valid and reliable screening tools, CAFC and our National Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Steering Committee are working, have been working, and are continuing to work with the Public Health Agency of Canada, as well as First Nations Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada, to develop an FASD screening toolkit. And it is important for me, and, and really an honor for me, to recognize the collaboration that really began in uh, 2007. Our steering committee members are Dr. Gideon Corrin, Dr. Ted Rosales, Dr. Ab Albert Chudley, Ab Chudley, Stuart McLeod, Christine Locke, Sterling Claren. Um, I'd also like to recognize our project manager, Charlotte Rosenbaum, who have been with us from, from the beginning. Uh, and most importantly, as highlighted in red on, on the screen, is our researchers, collaborators, and our workshop participants who have really helped lead this process um, from uh, 2007. I also want to acknowledge our partners, and I believe many of our partners from PHAC and First Nations Inuit Health Branch are on our webinar today. Mary Johnston, Pauline McKay, Debbie Hull, Tanya Churchill, Jen Andrews, and uh, Cindy Gay. So what are the goals of this important FASD collaboration? So first of all, to determine appropriate and effective screening tools that can be used by healthcare and allied health providers in identifying children and youth who may require a referral for a diagnosis, for an FASD diagnosis. To survey the literature, consult with screening tool researchers and key informants. Evaluate practical applicability of selected FASD screening tools and methods used to refer children to diagnostic clinics. And then finally, to develop those practical guidelines or the toolkit for recommended screening tools. And I think it's important um, to mention that currently there are five tools within the kit. This is a work in progress. It is a living document. It's a living kit. And we will, the goal is to add additional tools, again, that meet a set of criteria and methodology that I'm going to touch on in just a moment. So the overview of our process, as I mentioned, we began our collaboration and worked together in 07. And the first thing we did was to did a survey, in fact, of the, of the current capacity around FASD diagnostic clinics, uh, screening tools, and practices across the country. We also conducted and published a literature review, and that can be downloaded from the CAFC website. And we held our first of a series of four that followed a workshop in the fall of 2007, bringing together experts in the field mapping um, of screening toolkits and drafting recommendations as a result of the work that we did together um, over those first two days. In March of 2008, we uh, facilitated a stakeholders and consensus workshop where we engaged researchers in tool and manual improvement and development and, um, and carried that forward into a more in-depth uh, workshop in September of 2009 in which we targeted the production of pilot-ready tools and manuals, um, focusing on um, access and feasibility of the tools, and then implementation finally in uh, February of 2010. We launched in the fall of 2010 at CAFC's annual meeting that was held in Winnipeg a user-ready toolkit and instruction manuals for implementation in a variety of settings and populations. And I'm going to flip to those settings and populations in a moment. And this, um, as, as we've said before, is now being made available as a resource for frontline providers to screen for FASD. Important to share a little bit of the criteria that we chose for selection of the tools and our beginning with our definition of screening. 
we are following the UK National Screening Committee definition as a public health service in which members of a defined population who do not necessarily perceive they are at risk of or are already affected by a disease or its complications are asked a question or offered a test to identify those individuals who are more likely to be helped than harmed by further tests or treatment to reduce the risk of a disease or its complications. And we really have stayed very true to this, uh, to this definition. We also recognize throughout the process and of course continue to recognize the limitations of screening. Screening has the potential to save lives or improve quality of life through early diagnosis of serious conditions and this certainly is one. However, it is not a foolproof process. Screening can reduce the risk of developing a condition or its complications, but it cannot offer a guarantee of protection. And in any screening program, there is an irreducible minimum of false positive results, i.e. wrongly reported as having the condition, and false negative results wrongly reported as not having the condition. Again, as, as, as I mentioned a few slides ago, and, and this will be a repeated message, it really is important to define or to distinguish screening versus diagnosis. And screening is meant to include more children in the category of possibly affected than those who actually have the disease. And disease confirmation requires a diagnostic process. So what were the basic principles, or the, the, the guiding principles, really, that we followed and continue to follow? The toolkit was developed using a set of criteria to evaluate the identified tools in terms of sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values, as well as for their practical applicability in terms of ease of use, accessibility, cost, of course, being a factor as well, expertise required and having those resources, cultural appropriateness, as well as interpretation of results. Drilling down a little bit further in terms of the criteria, we follow the um, Wilson and Junger 1968 WHO um, criteria, looking at knowledge of the population and disease must be important recognize early symptoms, natural history is understood, knowledge and feasibility of the test, suitable test or exam for the population that you're going to target, case finding should be continuous, should be a continuous process, and again the test has to be acceptable to your population. Treatment or interventions for diseases looking at interventions, physical, psychological, and social benefits. Facilities for diagnosis and treatment are available. This is key. Um, and I'll really sort of just stop for a moment, pause there, and emphasize how important that is. Consensus on accepted management for those that are positive. There has to be a plan uh, in play. Societal and health systems issues around cost, balance costs, screening accessible to the entire population without adverse consequences for non-participants. Confidentiality and anti-discrimination measures have to be in place as well. So those were really our four primary uh, criteria. Um, 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 yes, those were our four uh, criteria that we followed in selecting the tools that you will find within the screening toolkit. At this point, I, I am going to hand over to my wonderful colleague, Dr. Giddy Corin, um, who has truly been one of the leaders um, in, in the development of this kit. And it's always an honor for me to recognize and to thank you, Giddy, for, for that leadership. Um, I think we also thought it might be a really nice uh, point in, in the presentation right now. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, we're, not, we're not seeing any up on the screen just yet. So just a reminder to use your question um, uh, box in the panel 
um, on the right hand uh, right hand corner of your screen, and we'll monitor them here and bring them forward so we we can all hear them and and uh, Giddy and I will do our best to answer them. So again, Giddy, I'd love to turn the control of the slide deck over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Elaine and Doug, for the help, and hello, everyone. It's quite, I'm quite fearful you sit in front of a screen. You don't know who will see you, who will listen to you. In a radio station, you can at least open it up. So I hope uh, my level of stress is not too high for this. Um, I will preempt and tell you again, uh, the first process that we have been through was a huge literature attempt with two PhD students actually doing their PhD work on fetal alcohol syndrome to bring out all the literature on screening for that particular condition, knowing the complexity of this condition. Can we do something about it? Uh, the criteria that Elaine mentioned was kept religiously, namely a lot of people offered criteria, but they did not validate them. They did not show that this particular test has a sensitivity, specificity, the epidemiology. And of course, not always they checked whether they are appropriate culturally and otherwise. So we, we acknowledge those. Naturally, I'm going to show you only the those who pass and uh, including our tool. Many other did not pass, but new tools will come up. So what we show you here is based on available evidence-based tools, not things that we made up for this process by nature. So altogether, there are presently five tools that our process over the last three years and more have uh, approved. And we'll talk about each one of them. Because these are not, it's not that we came to a place and chose the tools, but rather tools that made it into it, there are discrepancies. We don't have everything we need, of course. For example, we will describe the meconium testing for the newborn. Of course, after two days of life, you don't have meconium. The new behavioral screening tool that I'll describe was validated at age 6 to 18. So clearly, we do not have an AO behavioral profile for kids who are younger than that. Uh, the medicine wheel tool we are very proud of because it's based on work done with Aboriginal First Nation in Canada and aimed at them. And it's made mostly for the school setting. And again, the age is 4 to 14. And you can see it's not earlier than 4 and not validated above 14. The Asante Center Probation Officer Tool come from Dr. Asante Center in Vancouver, an amazing place. And uh, they worked for years in British Columbia to develop a probation officer tool. And we'll talk about that, of course large number of kids with delinquency in the system under probation officers were affected by alcohol in pregnancy. And the question is, can we screen to find those more likely to have the syndrome? Last but not least is the maternal drinking guide. One of the conditions for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is maternal drinking. And Maternal drinking assessment may sound easy, but it's not easy and unfortunately not used as much. Here, of course, the population is at-risk women. And if you look where these tests can be done, of course, meconium will do mostly in hospital, although quite a few women in Canada deliver at home with midwifery. The neo-behavioral testing will be done in schools. And it can be done by actually anyone who knows the kids enough to do it. It doesn't have to be medical people. It can be social services, the teacher, and so on and so forth. Medicine wheel, again, education, it's based in schools. The Asante tool for officers, probation officers, of course, is within the justice system. 
The maternal drinking guide is really for health and social services at the primary level, uh, asking the right questions, hopefully, to get the right answers. OK, let's start with meconium. Meconium, the first uh, fecal excretion of the baby, the first stool. It's available only in the first days of life, uh, to remind those who are not doing neonatal medicine or pediatrics. After the first day, actually, there is transitional stool, which is different from the meconium. The principle of the meconium test is that the first stool of the baby may have memory of things that the baby saw during pregnancy. Um, meconium testing did not start with alcohol, actually. It's used now for almost 25 years to detect drugs of abuse, cocaine, uh, uh, amphetamine, uh, heroin, and such. About 30 different drugs can be detected there. And why? Because, of course, baby sitting in this big aquarium is swallowing about, at term, about one liter a day and peeing it back into that sack. So things go through the GI and stay there. Alcohol itself does not stay there. It's a volatile compound, and it goes back to mom. However, when alcohol meets in the blood fatty acids, they are esterified or synthesizes to fatty acid ethyl ester. That's the alcohol and fatty acid. These compounds stay for much longer time, which can be measured and confirm fetal exposure to alcohol. Just to give you a couple of anecdotes about producing this test, if you find in meconium cocaine, it clearly had to come from mom. And it had to be consumed, because we do not produce cocaine in our body. However, we do produce alcohol. When we eat, or mom in this case, eats fruits, um, grapes, she produced alcohol as part of the metabolic process. So it took two to three years to see what are the levels of this FAE in babies of moms who did not touch alcohol. And we used some very religious populations, both uh, Muslims and Jewish, that just do not touch alcohol. And we obtained a level that you can measure even in people who did not use alcohol. And of course, any level that had to be meaningful had to be above it. So that's kind of the epidemiological principles that had to be followed. This can be used for population screening to identify rates of heavy alcohol exposure during pregnancy or in individual cases of suspected high risk. Let me take a second to, to give you examples here. We, our first study to show what does it mean was in the Gray Bruce area in Ontario, where we found that about 3.5% of babies born had high levels of FAEs. Now, to remind all of us, FASD occurs in only 40% of women who drink heavily. The other 60% are not affected. We still don't know why, but that's the fact. So 40% of these 3.5% that we found in Gray Bruce means about 1%. And that's what we believe is the percentage of babies affected. And that was brought up by other people, but confirmed by the test. So this is very useful to see. And these are, of course, anonymous tests. When mom gives a stool, a, a, a diaper, uh, knowing that no one can come back to, to link it to her or to the baby. A little bit like the studies that were done with umbilical cord blood with HIV to see rates, but without going back. But it can be used also for specific cases. Presently, of course, the specific cases it's used most is by children aids when they are very concerned based on other information about drinking what will happen to the baby. And they, of course, do it because they have the legal ability to do it. There's a huge question still open whether this can become a routine test 
without maternal permission. For the most part, this is not acceptable. And But I have to tell you, this was never in the court in Canada, so we are guessing what a court would say. There's a large group of physicians that say, hey, if I suspect syphilis in the baby, I go and check VDRL without permission. Why do I need to get it here? There's another camp clearly saying you cannot do anything uh, without parental permission. And this issue has not yet been resolved. As part of this effort, uh, we will conduct in September in PEI a symposium to address the question, bringing ethicists, judges, lawyers, and of course medical persons to see where we stand about it. As again, this was never yet challenged in the court, and then presently we are now also as part of this effort doing a study where we are offering the test openly to women and the contract quote unquote is that if mom agrees to participate and that's the way the ethics approval was this cannot serve against her and she's offered if the test is positive a follow-up of the baby including developmental nursing and related fields and we already have some very dramatic cases of uh, how this detected kids and are allowed to detect issues as early as possible. What's the benefits of meconium testing? It's clearly improved understanding of the epidemiology of alcohol exposure in pregnancy because you realize that all other methods are totally conditional on mom and family telling us about drinking. There are many reasons for women not to want to di disclose drinking. This is objective, so you don't need people's report, bias, recall, and so on and so forth. Women will not want to share that information necessarily, and here it's done anonymously. Um, they may not want because of guilt, because of fears of, of losing custody of a child, and so on and so forth. So clearly this can help in improving public health initiatives to address FASD. It's also very, very important if done on a baby, just think about it. You throw out the first meconium of a baby and you lost for life a direct proof that he or she were exposed to heavy alcohol. This means theoretically that the child may go lifelong without diagnosis because without knowledge on drinking, it's very difficult to diagnose FASD the, or fetal alcohol syndrome. The only time you can do this is when the face, the facial signs are to all there. Otherwise, you must have drinking history. Of course, by diagnosing a child as heavy, exposed to heavy alcohol, you can improve early diagnosis and interventions for FASD. There's increasing evidence that the earlier you detect and intervene, the outcome is better. This was shown first in Seattle by Strasga, who did it epidemiologically. She showed that kids diagnosed earlier were doing better, even if the exposure was larger. I kind of was a little bit cynical whether this is true, but the the full drama comes up if you take pups of mouse or rabbit and expose them to a lot of alcohol, they have fetal alcohol syndrome. You can prove it in various tests. If you take half of these pups and put them into a program of stimulation wheel and other challenges, you can improve them because of the plasticity of the brain. The nice thing in experimental models, you can look at the brain in the microscope and show improvement. So the window of opportunity is in young age. The meconium is very young age. It's at birth. You cannot go earlier unless mom tells you that she drank. And it's to identify high-risk pregnancy with potential benefits to both mother and child. Often the affected child is the evidence that mom is alcohol dependent. This is critical. 
because she may be pregnant again, as all, not always, but very often the case. And with advanced age, the risk of having fetal alcohol in the child increase statistically. So you may prevent it at different levels. Primary level with mom, if you can avoid her for drinking, or prevent pregnancy, or secondary preventer in a, in a child who already was exposed, but it allows you to intervene earlier. There are limitations. Meconium starts creating when the baby is 14 weeks of pregnancy, 12 to 14, basically when baby begin to swallow. So if mom drank in the first trimester only, the meconium will not show it. That's a given limitation. Now, in the absence of full interoperability, meconium testing results have the potential of misuse by courts, social services, and so on. So like any other test, this may serve against the mother um, if used inappropriately. And there is huge debate about this for obvious reasons. It has possible impacts on individual families and cultural groups require careful consideration. And, and that's the ethicality of doing a test that may be very critical for the baby, but may not be good for mom. And that's the maternal fetal conflict or potential conflict. And I'm not going to opine on it. I can tell you there are very large two camps with different views about it. At present time, it's relatively expensive. Costs 50 to $70 to do. But in the context of the cost of FASD in Canada, study done by, uh, by Brenda State as part of a PhD and repeated by her later last year, show that a baby with FASD cost till the age of 65 in excess of one million dollars. If we have one percent of babies in Canada uh, that are affected by FASD, this is about 4,000 babies a year, which is four billion dollars. In that context, early diagnosis by meconium, of course, the price is minuscule. Or in other words, the cost effectiveness is minuscule. OK, let's move to the Neo Behavioral Screening Tool. Dr. Before Gorin, uh, we've yes. had a few questions, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking a couple questions. By, for sure, I'll be delighted to. Um, first off, I was just wondering if, if we could get you to make your presentation full screen. Um, it, it, we can see it OK, but it, it would be a little bit larger. The type would be a little bit clearer if you, if you hit the, your slideshow menu at the top. There, there we go. That's, uh, that's better. Yeah. Um, so the first question is, what is the cost of meconium testing? And she's also asking, and how far does it go back? Yeah. Um, the cost presently is about $70. Um, I just said it about a minute ago. This may look excessive, but in the context of diagnosis, it's really very cheap. It goes back to the 14th week of pregnancy. The importance is, most women by that time know that they are pregnant, which means, of course, that they knew they are pregnant and they continue to drink. So beyond the high level, it also means that this was a problem drinking because moms don't want to, to, to damage any kid, but she was still drinking. So that's the strength of this. If it's first trimester, it won't be detected because if, if moms stop drinking after the first trimester, which may happen, of course, and it's, it's great news, but then we, a, a negative test, therefore, of meconium will not rule out drinking in the first trimester. All right, thanks. Uh, the second question we had was, um, she says, uh, or uh, he says, uh, we are dealing with a population of kids in care from birth and on. How should we proceed with screening and diagnosis of kids from, oh, says we have kids from, birth to, from birth to six other than meconium testing? Okay, excellent question. I think you might have missed a word in there when he typed it in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, excellent question. As I said, this toolkit is limited 
by what stood the criteria. So clearly, we have a problem. None of the tests beyond the, beyond the infancy of three days will, will, will at present time pass the mark. The narrow behavioral testing, as you see, is for H, was validated at present time for H6. And in a minute, you will see why. Yes? So what, what this toolkit offers is screening only when we have such a screening test. But our committee and effort will continue to look for other instruments that are published or brought forward to see if they make the cut. So as I said in the very beginning, we are now limited to tools that made the cut. But by no means this is ideal, because it does not cover yet things for which we don't have a test. All right. Um, Someone has also asked if the tests are, are available, and, and yes, they are available on the CAFSI Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, we yep. did have that up at the top of the uh, webinar, but we'll also be coming back with that URL later on. It's www.can.cafsi.org. But if you stick around at the end of the presentation, we'll have that up on a slide. Yep. Um, they're also asking if they uh, I just will tell you validated in French. And Elaine wanted to. Uh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Um, the toolkit itself has been translated and is available on the Knowledge Exchange Network, same URL that, that we have um, shown you on the screen. They have not been validated in French, though, as yet. But they are available, and the kit, as you can download it in English, is totally available for you en français as well. Thanks, and Elaine. as important, um, the next question is, yeah, if I may, go ahead, as important for each of these tools, if you go to the toolkit, we published the papers, the scientific papers, that showed them to be valid. So you can read and, and, and of course, test for yourself. Thanks, Gideon. That's, that's very important. On the Knowledge Exchange Network is all that information, as well as the proceedings from the process to develop the toolkit that has all of that information that Gideon has talked about, about how we came to the consensus on these specific tools. Uh, the next uh, uh, question is, what would the value be for having mom agree to the testing? Would she not know if she drank or not? So I guess you've already answered that question by uh, identifying how many weeks into the pregnancy that this test is valid. Yeah. Um, in in uh I can tell you that the rate of acceptance of this when it was anonymous was much higher than the rate of this attempt to approach mom and say, can we test? And it will not come to, to affect you, but rather to help you and the baby if it's positive. Naturally, you, as you can imagine, not everyone agree. There's still a national debate when it should be done on every baby, just to put it into context. Presently, we do thyroid testing on a baby, although hypothyroid affects one in 4,000 babies. We do it for phenylketonuria, which is one in 20,000. FASD is one in 100, and we don't do it yet on everyone. But that's not a medical question. It's a societal question. I should say that most physicians in the front line of neonatology, perinatology, uh, I cannot say most because it's not a valid, but because I'm dealing with this on a daily basis, because we test the FAEs in meconium, most of them are very, uh, most of them are very obvious that uh, they need those results to be able to deal with a kid. But there is a, a larger national question that has to be answered. Right. All right. Um, someone is also asking you just to go over something that she, she missed earlier on in the presentation. She's asking, uh, could you provide, again, the sensitivity of the test that you mentioned earlier? You said something about 40% of cases of heavy prenatal exposure result yeah. in that I, I, if, if the question is the sensitivity of the meconium to identify um, heavy maternal drinking, it's in excess of 90%. Of course, you have to remember, in all screening tools, you want sensitivity more than specificity. In other words, you don't want to miss out on maybe, but you know that that will lead now to full diagnostic and the baby still. So having high meconium FAE is not equal to fetal alcohol syndrome. No way. Because 
40% of kids will be affected. But the sensitivity of the case itself, which was, of course, based on mums who acknowledge drinking heavily, is above 90%, both in Case Western, uh, in, in Ohio, and in uh, the University of Toronto, where such studies were done. All right, we've, we've had a couple questions come in uh, in the last uh, couple of seconds. We're going to save those ones to the end. We want to make sure we get through all of the content. I'll just go over just a couple more qu relatively quick ones. Um, the question was asked, is the test readily available? Yes. Presently, the test is available at the Mother Risk Program at the University of Toronto, and we do it coast to coast, and for and some people in the U.S. too, but mostly in Canada. And uh, there's a couple of sort of related questions. Are the, are the norms well established, i.e. what is normal versus abnormal, and is this test useful in, for moderate alcohol consumption? Yes. Excellent question. As I said, we wanted to be able to not to frame a mum because her metabolism include producing alcohol from grapes, for example. So that's why we collected almost 1,000 mums, either Muslim or Jewish, who just don't touch alcohol. It's, it's anti-religion, and they are very religious women. And none of them had a level. I didn't mention the level, but I will now, of two nanomole per gram of, of meconium. Uh, all of them were below that, so we chose that as a cutoff. But I have to tell you that most positive cases are not around the two. There are 30, 50, 100 nanomolars. So, so yes, the sensitivity is there, specificity is there, and of course, uh, most important thing is not to miss out on positive cases. And uh, the only time it can happen, as I said, is if mom drank in the first trimester and then she stopped, the baby may be affected by the meconium may be negative. All right, this is the, I'll just, this will be just the last question for this segment, then we'll uh, go on with the, with the next tool. Uh, this last question is, uh, does it have to be the first stool passed, or can it be any stool in the first 24 hours? Yeah, the, the, the most important part is the 24 hour. After 24 hour, what happened, babe already fed by mom, who have carbohydrates, either if it's breastfeeding or if it's bottle feeding. And those carbohydrates begin to ferment into alcohol. So it has to be in the first 24 hours best. We still, if there's no 24 hour, let's say it was missed or anything, we still want to do a later test. Because if it's negative, it's still very reassuring. If it's positive, you have to ask yourself, is it really meconium, or is it transitory stool, or real stool? And sometimes you can look at it and you know if you know how to look at it. Um, but, but clearly, it's not so much the first meconium passing, but rather the first 24 hours is, is the best result. And just to just to mention, um, our last webinar we had lots of questions, and we actually extended the webinar for those who who were able to hang on while we just answered some of the questions. And for those who aren't able to hang on, we did include all of that question period in the recording. So if you see the presentation but aren't able to stay on for the questions at the end, you will be able to go back to the Knowledge Exchange Network and and view the webinar if if you just want to see the questions at the end. So that being said, uh, Dr. Korn, we'll hand it back over to you to move on to the neurobehavioral screening. Team. Yeah, thank you. Parents who deal with kids with fetal alcohol syndrome, and indeed medical people too, always had a feeling that these kids are different, have something in them, in their behaviors, but it was never felt to be specific enough. In other words, low IQ, behavioral problems, can happen with many other conditions. Uh, so quite a few groups in the world try to find what's the phenotype, what's the behavioral phenotype that will identify these kids. This is not diagnosis, please remember. This is as a screening tool. And Dr. Joanne Rovet at the University of Toronto noticed, based on kids diagnosed in cl clinic, that on one of the most validated tests in the world, the child behavior checklist, which is the Achenbach test, for those of you who are more familiar with the field, the kids who were diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome were very unique in a set of questions that they came positive again and again and again. 
So while the Achenbach is over 140 questions, there are a few items from the Achenbach that were positive specifically in kids with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and not with kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and not with conduct disorder. And here are there. Act too young for his age, cannot concentrate, poor attention, which is typical of ADHD. And to remind you, 70% of kids with fetal alcohol syndrome have ADHD, cannot sit still, that's part of it. Disobedient at home, no guilt after misbehaving, which you hear a lot from care caregivers and other about these kids. Impulsive act without thinking, which again is part of the attention deficit part. Lying and cheating. Do remember, these are not items made by Dr. Joan Rovet, but rather taken from the Achenbach. She found out that those items repeat themselves much more commonly in kids affected by alcohol. So this was validated several times already epidemiologically by repeating it in another set of kids. The benefits of this screening tool can identify kids who may have FASD and differentiate them from ADHD. For example, kids with ADHD are not bullying other kids. And although they are not well behaving, it does not include externalizing behaviors. It's it's more that they cannot concentrate. It's a simple checklist that can be administered by parents or by any caregiver or health professional who know the kid or talk to someone who knows the kid. Um, it's felt in general that it may not be best to be, do, to be done by the parents themselves, but we in clinic in Toronto addressing it to the parents. We're asking them questions about it. Um, so, so, so this is unique because it's the first of these type of tests that was validated epidemiologically. It was validated from age 6 to 18. One of the main reasons it's kids younger than 6, it's not easy to diagnose attention deficit disorder. Young kids are all over the place anyway and you cannot necessarily define that portion. Uh, it can be done not necessarily by health professionals. It can be done by social workers and so on and so forth, child workers. Very critical, they have to know the child. They have to talk to someone who knows the child. For example, about the points about how he or she behaves at home. It takes about five minutes to do. And in that sense, it's, it's very friendly. Um, the next tool is maternal drinking guide. The purpose of this tool is to determine if the woman drinks or has drunk at a problem drinking level in pregnancy. By the way, it's worth mentioning that each of these tools will have its own webinar. So at much more depth, but of course, I'm quite happy to answer questions to the best of my ability as a professional, because uh, I'm not a psychologist, of course. This is a guide to be used by health and social services professionals within their practices as part of their overall health assessment. It's not a secret that physicians don't ask routinely about drinking in, in general and in pregnancy particularly. It's not a question that people ask. So the attempt here was to search all the literature to identify tools that were validated as helpful. And, uh, and that was the purpose of it. Uh, before I go into the benefits, which are quite obvious, the literature search identified different levels of questioning. Uh, just an example of, a, of an effective introductory statement. And I'm giving you just a glimpse of it. This will be covered by Mumita, uh, who did her PhD on that in, in a subsequent webinar. Here is an example of a 
positive way to introduce the topic. I want to ask you a series of questions today about your lifestyle. I ask all my patients these questions because it helps me to get better understanding of what your day-to-day -day life is like in terms of diet, exercise, and lifestyle. I will help you, uh, it will help me to know you and will help me to provide better care. Or for pregnant women, I will begin by asking you standard series of health questions. I ask all my pregnant patients in order to improve your health and the health of your child. And you should say the name of the child if the child is, of course, already born. There are some examples I'll give you of practice-based questions proven effective by research studies. For example, when was the last time that you had a drink? Do you ever enjoy a drink or two? Or in positive frame. Just to contrast this, avoid questions such as, do you drink often? How much are you drinking? Um, and avoid questions that requires yes or no responses. It's preferable to ask open-ended questions. So what we did here, of course, is we took what the literature offers to be effective. So it not, was not based on our own taste. It was based on what was proven in, in scientific literature. Then, of course, there are the questionnaires you may be familiar to ask about problem linking, the tweak, the TAs, and so on and so forth. The tweak and the TAs came superior to most other tests when it comes to pregnancy we made a decision to bring only one of them, but we make the point clear that if you are using effectively the TAs, don't change your habit. And, uh, of course, this is an, an attempt to include tools, and it gives you a menu, actually. You don't have to do all of it. All you need to do is ensure that you choose something that fits your own style and you think that will work well on, on your patients. Um, there are clear benefits. Those methods have been validated as effective means of eliciting maternal alcohol use. It provides you as practitioner with options appropriate for different groups and circumstances. The questions are easily integrated into overall assessment of patients. Of course, one of the claim is uh, some of the methods are direct, some are not direct, indirect, and again, I found this as a clinician very useful for even myself because this area is not well covered. Although it sounds very simple, it's not simple. There are limitations. All of us are pressured by time and you have to, to put time into it. You have to cover a lot of issues. Uh, so some of the questions are, are very short and some of them are larger or wider, and you may want to choose what fits you. Um, now, the second point here, services for referral of the drinking mum or the problem drinker mum may not be available to everyone. That said, it's still very critical to know that mum is a problem drinker. In general, you should know that one of the criticism against this whole toolkit was, okay guys, so we'll have so many more kids that may be suspect of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Where are you going to send them all? Well, first, there's no, there's no doubt that without knowing the real scope of this, we will not make pressure on our governments to create availability. And I think the question is where to send them must be addressed. There's no question. But the tools will help us identify kids that should be seen first rather than later. Um, one claim is that methods have not been fully validated for use in eliciting retrospective alcohol consumption during a pregnancy. So if, if baby is now three, or child is three, and he show other problems, you ask mom about behavior before. This is correct. This is correct. Uh, but still, if to the extent that mom is ready to, in, to, to cooperate with you, this information is still important. And of course, this, this tool 
tool is for population of women at risk. Um, although we all b believe that this should be asked of every woman and you cannot make clear, uh, you, you cannot be sure that a woman is not a problem drinker unless you ask. Making stereotyping will not cut here. You cannot assume that certain groups are not drinking. This is very clear in Canada and, and elsewhere. We are moving to the medicine wheel tool. This aim at addressing a very complex population of First Nation, uh, um, First Nations and uh, Aboriginal Canadian, where clearly this is a huge issue acknowledged by everyone. This was developed in a cultural, spiritual, and family context. The tool is have been tested in First Nation context and also adapted to Inuit cultures. The tool fits with traditional practices, including the name, as you can see here, and in, include a student index tool that is useful in identifying and tracking specific behaviors and changes in these behaviors over time. This is based on the school where teachers know the kids. Another advantage is that diagnosis by itself is just a diagnosis, or in this case, a screening is just a screening. Whereas if you identify issues, you can already begin to remedy them in school as part of doing the right things educationally. There are limitations. Of course, the tool is based on questions about the child, both his or her behaviors, achievement in school, interactions with others, and so on and so forth. The tool was validated in a small community in uh, New Brunswick, but it needs further validation by Dr. Laurie Cox, who invented it. She is a clinical psychologist, an amazing individual. Uh, human resources may be severely limited in some Aboriginal communities to do this, but again the advantage is that it's done educationally and uh, it will help the kid in the very setting of the, of the school. Again, services for referral and assessment may not be available everywhere. Again, the same point, unless you know the size of the issue, you will not get anyone to move on it. The best way was to ignore it. Of course, it needs to train resources for tool implementation, which has not been fully assessed. For example, the drinking mum questionnaires are simple and done by physicians. The meconium is simple because it's done by a lab. The neurobehavioral test is a bunch of very few simple questions, so again, it's easy to score. This one is heavy. It has to be done by teachers and community people who were instructed in the tool. Effectiveness has been tested in the first two years of using the tool in 237 children and 23 of them proceeded to diagnostic clinics. So already out of a group of kids, you choose those who appear to be screening positive. And here's the big thing. 65 of these 23 were diagnosed with FASD, which is excellent because it means effectiveness of the tool. Of the 187 children, approximately 20% were diagnosed with FASD by the end of 2009 to a tail school year. Uh, Lori Cox reports in her report that children in the community who were diagnosed with FASD were able to receive appropriate support in school, which is great. The same team that screened them could use some of these elements to move ahead with them. With this support, diagnosed youth have been able to attend and graduate high school. A few have gone to college and post-secondary training. So there are hints here of effectiveness. This must be done, and I should tell you, which we didn't, uh, but I know Elaine will do it later. All these five tools are now validated in other contexts, not the context that they were invented, both for feasibility and, of course, whether the values that were reported are real, real and true as must be, to allow generalizability. The last tool is the youth probation officer. 
And it's not a secret that probably a lot of youth and adults with FASD are overrepresented in the justice system. It has been estimated that 50% of inmates in Canadian jails were, were born to alcoholic moms. Even if that sounds high, clearly a lot of the issues are there because of the maladaptive behavior that goes with FASD. So this tool aim at probation officers, the very people who have to make the decisions what happened to these youngsters, how the system. At present time, the system does not acknowledge FASD, does not do anything for it. There are some very sad Canadian cases where kids, well, youngsters were sent to jail for many years for crime, not acknowledging that they had FASD. It was invented and validated in British Columbia. Just for interest, the second validation happening now is in Manitoba, just to show you how we chose to see that things really work as they have declared. The purpose is to screen young offenders for the risk of FASD and then refer them, of course, to further assessment and diagnosis. Again, what Elaine said, and we'll repeat many times, screening is not diagnosis. The same way that glucose tolerant test is not the diagnosis or high glucose in in the blood or urine is not the diagnosis for diabetes. You need more. The same is here. The benefits, of course, is to address the need of a high-risk group, young offenders. The referral form is user-friendly, self-explanatory. The manual is clearly written, includes relevant research. Case management form is very practical and useful. Criteria for referral for further diagnosis are clear. And the tool extensively used with the youth justice probation system in British Columbia. Um, it's based, of course, again, on questions that supposed to separate these kids from other kids with delinquency issues. Some of the limitations. Access to maternal history of information varies across jurisdiction. Not always the youngster will know to tell you if mom was drinking, especially if he or she are adopted or were in care of the system. Uh, then it will not be known. There is some time constraint there, similar to what physicians and Again, there is a need for acceptance by the system. In this case, of course, the system above the probation officers. Again, the point that we made almost with every tool, OK, so we have a kid who is suspect. Who is going to test him or her for diagnosis? Again, the same point. Unless we know the extent of the issue, we'll not get more attention to it. Although fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is number one mental deficiency in youth in Canada. And it's still not being approached appropriately. Um, of course, to require implementation in other jurisdiction, this is done as we're talking now in Manitoba. I think with that, I will return, uh, I'll return the talk to Elaine, who will share with you the strategy that our task force is taking. Hey, thanks, Gideon. Um, just a few, we'll just take a few questions before we hand over to Elaine. Uh, the first question, actually, I'll just refer to this first question to our previous webinar. Um, the person's asked, when is the effect of alcohol exposure in utero most harmful to the infant, and what is the least amount of ingestion needed for FAE? Uh, well, the first part of the question, actually, I'll, I'll sort of answer here, and that was extremely well described by Dr. Sterling Claren and Christine Locke in our webinar number one. Uh, everything from sort of the history of FASD diagnosis of, of the disease uh, to uh, a great description of the sort of the, the physiology and the anatomy of the disease and at what stages it takes place and that sort of thing, and in particular, at what stages it's most harmful to the fetus. So I encourage you to go to the Knowledge Exchange Network and, and take a look at that webinar and you'll, you'll get all of that information. Um, but she's also asked, uh, Dr. Korn, uh, what is the least amount of ingestion needed for FAE? Yeah. Um, for 
FAEE -E for 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 the meconium you mean for the positive yes. meconium well as you realize this information will never ever be available in people because for to get that you need mums who tell you or even chart what they did and often this is not possible the the, the one fact is clear positive FAE equal problem drinking the dose is then less important because FASD has been described almost only with problem drinking. We did a study showing that mums who admit to small amounts of, of drinking, say social drinkers, are not positive in the meconium test. So positive meconium test equal problem drinking mother. The amount cannot be proven in humans easily, but we proved it in guinea pigs. And you can show the more you give them, the more positive the test, and the smaller the brain, and the small and, and many other issues you can show in animal studies. But I don't think it will be so easy to prompt level to how much mom drank because of the nature of the patient here. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the next question is: um, Within the four-digit code, is there room for more weight to be given to? Neurobehavior, neurobehavioral issues as this intersects with so many other developmental and social developmental areas. Yeah, uh, that's the, person an, continues on, yeah. the person continues on to say these children suffer frequently, or these children frequently get deferred until academic issues start to suffer. Yeah. ARND possible children are falling through huge cracks in the system because they do not get diagnosed until later, if at all. I, t I totally agree. This is an excellent, excellent question. Uh, to remind all that the four digit to some extent was developed by geneticists and people with dysmorphologists. Clearly the the one to four on the brain part is not enough. And and actually the Canadian guidelines that came later suggested more sensitive criteria, but again stick to two standard deviation below the mean for the different tests. And many of my colleagues, psychologists and psychiatrists, claim that that's too harsh because if a kid is on one standard deviation on five domains, that, that's terrible too. So, so I totally um, agree with the question and, and with the nature of, the, of what it addressed. Of course, the four digit is part of the diagnosis and not the screening. So we did not set up in this particular offer at all or effort to to criticize the four digits or any other diagnostic criteria. Uh, but I totally agree that that must be addressed as soon as possible. All right, thanks. And for those of you who aren't familiar, who may not be familiar with the four digit code, that was also discussed in the first webinar. They gave a, an excellent description on the, the code that, that, that is used, the, the process for diagnosing FASD. Um, the next question, and again, this is a bit of a long one, Dr. Korn, but uh, it says, as much as I would like children who are alcohol affected to be identified and receive services, I have concerns about how the neurobehavioral tool is used in schools. Would parental permission be required? Would a supportive relationship between parent and a professional, such as a social worker, be developed before the screening? In the kit, it is mentioned that teachers could complete it, but would they be the ones to initiate and report to parents? And if you need me to repeat any of that, just let me know. No, 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 no. This is an excellent question, and it, it's not foreign to me because, as you imagine, we we agonize on that for over three years now. This, the uh, the screening is part of a medical act, and it must be done with parental consent. Typically, parents or legal guardians, it can be adopting or other other arrangements, have a concern about the child. No one screen kids who are doing well socially, um, uh, academically, and so on and so forth. So, so it has to animate from a parent or a guardian who say, Johnny has a problem and we need help. So the way there's no way to do it without guardians' support and agreement. No question about it. Uh, the question come up more about the meconium, as I said, because you lose an opportunity. And uh, although I won't um, answer it fully because of time, very often uh, people in the nursery say, 
we have suspicion that mom is a chronic drinker, uh, but they have to approach the ch child service uh, protection authorities and so on. One, one, one potential solution for those of you on the front line is to put the sample, the diaper in a freezer before you throw it out to see where things will fall. Because if you throw it out, you may lost for life the knowledge the child was exposed to heavy drinking that may affect him or her life forever. On the other hand, there is this area of how you ethically do it when you have a maternal fetal conflict. But as to the neurobehavioral testing it, and the other tests I described, it always has to be done in the context of uh, agreement and consent. All right, thanks. Um, the next question is regarding matern the maternal drinking guide, addressing only at-risk women is very subjective. Who is at risk? How about upper middle class women who we know often drink at a problem level but never feel FASD is a concern for them? Excellent question. I'm very glad you brought it up. Because of the brevity, because of the short time, I didn't do justice. And of course the webinar on that will, will deal with this with much more justice. However, the first level of asking should be on every patient that you have. And that's a single question. Because, of course, mom and I answer, I don't drink. I just don't drink, religiously or otherwise. Only 50 to 55 percent of Canadian women drink, so other are not necessarily drinking. Um, so, so clearly, you are not targeting or stereotyping any subpopulation. You ask those questions, everyone. If the answer is positive, you move deeper. And the guide will give you deeper levels of asking and how to ask it. And of course, if after those, you come to the conclusion that the drinking is not just social or very limited, then there are the tools that I, again, briefly describe, and I apologize just because of time, the, the tools that deal with problematic drinking, such as the tweak. And uh, you, you can get the deeper information there. Now, that said, clearly, all these are as good as mom is really to collaborate or cooperate. No question. But how you ask the questions. So clearly there should be no stereotyping here. And the decision to ask questions, we believe that every physician should ask every patient, clearly every woman, clearly every woman in the context of pregnancy, those generalized questions. Single questions first, and then as needed, deeper questions. We even have a, a graph. Uh, yeah, a chart, a flow chart to show the decisions. When would you do it? All right, thanks, uh, Dr. Korn. I think we're going to save uh, some of the, the, the remaining questions for the end. I'm just going to hand it over to Elaine just so she can finish up the, the final portion of the presentation. We can try and get finished pretty close to on time at, uh, at 2.30 uh, Eastern time. And then we'll, as I mentioned earlier, we'll continue to take some questions into, some, into the overtime session. And, uh, and, and for those of you who, who have to leave, uh, by all means, you, you have to leave. And for those who want to see the, the questions but aren't able to stay around, as I mentioned, we will be posting the full duration of the presentation on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, so we're just going to uh, hand it over to Elaine. Thank you. I was saying, December is a tremendous time. So as I mentioned right at the beginning of today's webinar, the official launch of our FASD screening toolkit took place in October of last year at our annual conference uh, in Winnipeg. And um, between January of this year until March of 2012, we are in the process, which is well underway, of transitioning from the hard copy toolkit, and I believe many of you have probably seen and I hope have a copy of, to an interactive format on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. Today, when you go on to the CAN, you will find it. Right, you know, it's an electronic version, of course, but it is P it, these are PDF documents, 
but what we are currently creating and will be available to all very, very shortly is an opportunity to interact with the tool, with each other, through the Knowledge Exchange Network. And again, the uh, www.ken.cafc.org will get you there. Coast to coast outreach um, today, for example, we have tremendous representation from right across Canada and beyond our borders. Um, and we have implemented a bilingual functionality. The tool has been translated um, at, as the complete toolkit. Implementation of our FASD webinar series to include development, performance, and follow-up. So this series just began. This is number two. Um, our third webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, May the 4th, and they're always at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. And the focus there will be on prenatal exposure screening tools and the Maternal History Guide and Meconium FAEE testing. So we're really going to drill down. And obviously, everyone, once again, is welcome. And this is really now we're going to target the population that each of these tools was uh, designed for. The fourth webinar will be on Wednesday, June the 1st, again, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And that will focus on the maladaptive behavior screening tools, the neurobehavioral checklist, as well as screening for uh, youth probation officers in great detail. And the fifth uh, webinar will, uh, will be on Thursday, June the 30th. And um, that will be led by uh, Lori Vitelli Cox and it will be on the medicine, um, medicine wheel screening tools. And finally, date to be determined in the fall, we are going to have a webinar that we've entitled The Ethics of Meconian Screening. And uh, this will be presented by Dr. Stuart McLeod. And all of the dates that I've just quickly rambled off are available for you right on uh, CAFC's homepage at www.cafc.org. You've seen the slide uh, right at the beginning that Doug um, sort of walked us through. And just as a, just a bit of a repeat, um, to view the CAN directly, sorry, to view the FASD uh, screening toolkit directly on CAN. The URL is listed at the top of this slide. And um, again, in terms of accessing, you can search uh, under FASD, use the tag cloud, and click FASD. This will all make sense when you're on the Knowledge Exchange Network. And then, of course, you can continue to browse the toolkit category by category from the front page. I want to conclude, um, and, and let me just say that Doug and myself, and, and, uh, and I really want to acknowledge Doug Maynard's um, true and very serious expertise in this area in terms of the development of the Knowledge Exchange Network, accessing, really using it for the many, many advantages that, that it was intended um, I would encourage you, if you have any difficulty at all accessing the tool, to please get in touch with us at the CAFC office, and I'm going to conclude with that contact information. Where are we now in terms of continuing to develop the tools? So we'll refer to this as our continuation project that began on April 1st of last year, 2010, and will run until March 31st, 2012. The primary goal, so what are we doing currently? We are improving capacity for FASD screening of children and youth in various jurisdictions, settings, and for multiple populations and age groups, as well as, or as part of that, piloting four of the five tools that we've reviewed today in different jurisdictions across Canada. We're also building on lessons learned from researchers and experts in the field and, and broad input from frontline providers, input that has come from today's webinar that we're going to record. And that exchanging of knowledge will continue with colleagues from across the country, again, from different jurisdictions, areas of expertise, 
we've approached this from a modular perspective, and you can see the four modules that are listed here for you, the meconium testing, the neurobehavioral screening toolkit, the maternal problem drinking guide, and the Asante Center, the probation officer tool. Um, I just want to point out, as per the, the note on the bottom of the screen, that the medicine wheel, although not being um, piloted in this particular continuations program, a lot of that work has been done in the area of Elsa Pockdog in New Brunswick, as Giddy mentioned earlier. And um, it continues, actually, to be piloted in a northern community um, as the northern circle tool. So very much um, work, uh, work ongoing. At this point, I'll just put up our contact information. And again, please don't hesitate to get in touch with, with Doug or myself. Um, telephone and email addresses are there for you and again, access to our website and or the Knowledge Exchange Network. So at this point, I think we can turn back to Doug. Um, we'll, we'll wrap up officially in, in just a few minutes, but turn back to Doug to, um, to share the, the remaining questions. Thanks, Elaine. Um, and, and as has been mentioned a few times, uh, more detailed webinars on each of the individual tools are coming uh, according to the schedule Elaine just uh, went over. So if if there's any questions that don't end up getting answered, that there are quite a number of questions on the, in the hopper, so it's possible we may not get to everybody's, but we will try, and if not, then by all means come back to one of the subsequent webinars. Um, so Dr. Corrin, uh, here's a question for you. Um, it says, are there any recommendations for transferring TACE or tweak results into the newborn's health file? I, for example, confirmed prenatal exposure so that information is not lost. Yeah, that, that, that's a... a a very important question. As you know, many jurisdictions, for example in Ontario, the parking questionnaire includes a single question to mama done by the nurse uh, in the nursery or elsewhere. Did you use alcohol or drugs, any drugs? That's a single question. Whereas now, the I totally agree with the question and with the intent and answer that it's a terrible thing if we lose that continuity of information. It doesn't happen now, not just in this area, in many areas of medicine. Hopefully, this will be rectified when we go more into electronic databases or medical charts. Uh, but at present time, to the best of my knowledge, despite so logical, it does not happen. And very often, from one authority to the next, information about problematic drinking is not crossing. And that's a major, major concern. All right. The uh, next question is, we know that a large percent of our children and youth will be with, with FASD are in care. Could the youth probation officer's tool be used by CAS workers or Children's Aid Society workers? That, that, that's, a, again, an excellent question. Uh, presently, for example, the Mother's Clinic that diagnose in southwestern Ontario have very strong relationship with Children's Aid Societies exactly for that reason. The, I, I, I'm sure you noticed that the probation officer tool starts or validated to age 14 and up. So the extent that the child is, uh, is in, a care, in children aids care and above the age of 14, that's a very interesting question. We never heard about this question before and we, that's one of these things that this webinar is very effective to bring up other ideas. So I, I I fully promise you to bring this up. This is an excellent idea. The microphone on mute. Um, the uh, probation officer tool, can it be used with the adult population? Yes, yes. There's no, um, I don't believe there's a limitation age-wise. However, as I said, at present time it was validated mostly for youth for obvious practical reasons. But similar to the question about the CAS use, this is again, we'll bring it up because this will take a different type of effort research-wise to validate it and show the main issue here, as you know, that there are very few clinics around the country to diagnose FASD in adults. Um, so, so the main issue will be to bring, um, 
to, to bring these adults suspect based on the based on the uh, on the uh, on the screening to be tested but I don't see a reason why that should not happen we'll bring it up that's again a, an excellent question is uh, who is the contact for a meconium test to get done? She works in a child welfare context and they have something called an alert that is frequently used for women with severe addiction issues. These children always come into care and we could cover the cost of the screening. Yeah, uh, I can give you, it so happened that I'm at Sick Kids Hospital and I can give you, uh, the contact is the Mother is Cl Drug Testing Laboratory and I'll give you one number. The the number is uh, Joey Guerreri, and uh, it's four one six eight one three five seven eight zero. And we the test is done by the lab for many many children aids and other authorities, coast to coast, as we talk. Oh, this next question was someone just wanted to thank us for the great presentation. She's looking forward to the next one, so I guess we don't need to answer that one. Thank you for that. And thank you for that. Um, we keep uh, the next question is: We keep hearing about an emphasis on, on problem drinkers for intervention during pregnancy, and it appears the message about no known safe level is still not standard. Shouldn't problem drinkers include all alcohol drinkers during pregnancy in order to reduce confusion and streamline our message? This is a very important question that is on the front uh, front line. <clears throat> it is true that the safety of low drinking level has not been confirmed at the absolute level, but Ernst Abel, the one of the gurus of Fitako syndrome out of Detroit, a Canadian actually, suggested that the name of the syndrome should be changed to fetal alcohol abuse syndrome. He Ernst claims in his books that show me a kid with FASD that mom was a problematic drinking. So while the message should be out, clearly no amount is safe. I can tell you when a woman called Mother is Program, and there are about 200 of them a day, about 20 or 30 will tell us that they drank a little bit before they found out they are pregnant, because 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. And we tell them that they don't have a risk for fetal alcohol syndrome. On the same time, if the same woman call and say, I am pregnant and I want to go to my sister's wedding, we will tell her not to drink. So we are talking from both sides of our mouth, but you understand why. So the, the, the idea with the screening was to deal with a high risk group. The, the thing is how to find the drinker who is not stereotypically in the high risk group high education and so on and so forth. But the decision to centralize on women who are in the high drinking range, problematic drinking, is really to focus where the risk is much higher. And as I said, uh, most, most scientists in the field agree that low amount of drinking, while very difficult to prove that has no effect, has not been associated with FASD. Okay, thanks, Giddy. I think at this point, um, we, we're definitely. I love the way Doug coined. We're in the overtime session of the of the webinar, um, and again, um, I want to uh, to thank uh, to thank you, Giddy. Uh, Co-presenting is is always um, an honor for me, and and again, thank you for your leadership. I also want to recognize uh, Doug Maynard's uh, leadership in today's webinar, in all of CAFC's webinars, and uh, and again would invite those who need more information or perhaps a little bit more guidance as to how to um, maneuver and, and become more comfortable within the Knowledge Exchange Network, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And again, the contact information is still up on your screen. Um, lastly, I want to thank all of our participants. Um, we have had close to uh, 200 or so uh, people participating on today's webinar, truly a pan-Canadian representation, and as I said, beyond Canada's borders. Um, we continue and will continue to be very committed to this work here at CAFC, and again, this work that is being led by our steering committee. 
um, please don't hesitate to follow up um, if there's any information that you feel we didn't cover on today's webinar. Again, as Doug has mentioned, um, we will post all of our presentations uh, on the Knowledge Exchange Network. There will be podcasts created as well. And um, we absolutely look forward to welcoming everyone back to our third webinar, which will be on May the 4th at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And um, I would just bid everyone a wonderful afternoon. And again, tremendous thanks for your interest and your participation. And we certainly hope this has been a helpful session for you. Bye, everybody.